Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and liberty and justice for all. Members, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you the Governor of the Great State of Louisiana, Honorable Bobby Jindal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you all very much, Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, statewide elected officials, members of the House, members of the Senate, my family, your beautiful First Lady, to the great people of the great state of Louisiana. Thank you for the privilege of coming to talk to you today as we start the first session of this new legislative body. I want to start just first of all by recognizing that right here in our own state today, even as we start these important proceedings, in southwest Louisiana due to these rising floodwaters, as we speak, we have sheriff's deputies, local first responders, we've got National Guard resources, we've got state police and others as we speak, along with wildlife and fisheries and others, helping to rescue people from harm's way. I think we should give our first responders a great round of applause for what they're doing for us today. You know, Supriya and I have had the privilege of coming down those steps a number of times, and today we certainly recognize many familiar faces. I want to start by congratulating those of you that are returning. I also want to recognize we've got many new faces in both the House and the Senate. I would like to just take a moment to ask our newly elected members of the House and the Senate to please stand. Let's give our new members a great round of applause, congratulating them on their elections to this great body. I did that just to see if Greg Tarver would stand up or not. I don't know if he can stand up for a new, new member or not. Four years ago, I had the privilege of giving an inaugural address and then come talk to this joint legislative body. At that time, I promised you the beginning of our first term together. I promised you we would work together to create a new Louisiana. I told you it was simply unacceptable that Louisiana was the only state in the South that for 25 years consistently was exporting our best and brightest, our greatest assets to other states. Year after year, we were the only state to send our sons and daughters to Texas, Georgia, other states to pursue their dreams. I promised you we would work together to create a new Louisiana, to keep our children and grandchildren at home, to bring back the entrepreneurs, the dreamers, the innovators. I told you we would have to be bold. And I want to thank you. I want to thank the returning members. We did work together. We had a special session literally within that first month after we all were taking our oaths of office. And during that first session, we overhauled Louisiana's ethics laws, went from 44th worst, according to the Center for Public Integrity, for legislative disclosure, to number one in the entire country. Went from the, uh, the bottom five on the Better Government Association's Integrity Index to the top five. But we didn't stop there. We then had another special session just weeks later, getting rid of taxes on debt, new equipment, and utilities. Working together, we went through challenges like the hurricanes Gustav and Ike, and like the BP oil spill. And thanks to your bold actions, we said we were going to be bold. We're not going to go from 44th to 30th. We want to be number one. Thanks to your bold actions, we have seen the results in our economy. For four years now, every single month, every single month, our unemployment rate has been below the national and southern averages. On every significant national business ranking, Louisiana now has the highest ranking we've ever enjoyed when it comes to our business climate, our competitive climate. Indeed, you look at the various rankings, Southern Business Development ranked Louisiana the state of the year for three years in a row thanks to our economic development wins. Created tens of thousands of jobs. December marked 15th straight month of private sector job growth. And here's perhaps the most important number. After 25 years of losing our young people, for four years in a row, we've had more people move into Louisiana rather than leave our state. For the first time, we're getting to, beginning to bring back our children and our grandchildren. But today is not a day to look backwards. Today is indeed a day to look forward. The reality is I don't stand before you today to brag about the last four years, but rather to talk to you about the challenges we face in the next four years. And that is why for this session we will, I'm sure, debate literally hundreds of bills. But I want to focus today my remarks with you on two very important topics for the future of Louisiana. For if we want to continue to outperform the South and this country economically, if we want to continue to create more opportunities for our people, we must start by reforming and improving our educational system. 
Now, there are many reasons to start with education. Seventy percent of the companies who want to move here or expand here tell us one of their top two concerns is finding a skilled worker. Indeed, there are many practical reasons whether you want to lower the incarceration rate in this state, whether you want to improve health care outcomes, whether you want to grow the economy, it all comes back to education. Make no mistake about it. It is great we have cut taxes. It is great we've revamped the ethics code. But the states and the countries that have the most educated, the most skilled, the most productive people, the most productive workers, are those states, those countries, that are going to win in this modern global economy. When we were able to convince New Corps to make that investment in St. James Parish, our competition, the final competition, wasn't between Louisiana and Texas or Georgia or Mississippi. It was Louisiana and Brazil. We had a company in southwest Louisiana. We recently announced moving manufacturing jobs back from China. Increasingly, we're competing in a global economy. But you know, the imperative, the moral imperative to improve education for our children is more than an economic one. The reality is the moral imperative to improve education goes to the heart, the heart of the American dream. What do I mean by that? We are blessed and privileged to live in the greatest country in the history of the world. One of the things that makes us such a great country is that your last name, the circumstances of your birth, your gender, your zip code should not determine your outcome as an adult. The reality is we as a country believe that the economic, the economic status of your parents, where you were born, where you grew up, shouldn't determine your outcomes when you grew up in life. Indeed, how many of us have heard from our parents growing up? If you work hard in school, if you work hard and apply yourself, you can do whatever you dream. You could become the next president of the United States. You could start your own business. You could become a teacher. You could become a lawyer, a doctor. You could start your own business. That is one of the things that sets America apart. And yet, as the preacher who prayed our prayer just now, just minutes ago, mentioned, and as I agree, we live at a time when people worry that we may be the first generation of Americans that leaves fewer opportunities for our children than we inherited from our parents. Now, I don't believe that's going to be true. I believe this century belongs to America. I don't believe this century belongs to China. I don't believe there's any other country that can beat us, but I do believe this. For us to continue to provide that American dream to our children, it starts with a great education. And I tell you that not only because of the various economic studies, I tell you that because I've seen it in my own life. My dad is here today, and you know, he is living proof of the American dream. My dad's one of nine kid children. Grew up in that proverbial house without running water and electricity. First and only one to get past the fifth grade in his family. I know because I've heard these stories every single day of my life growing up. When you try to complain in our house about the lack of an allowance, my dad would simply tell you two things. He'd say, well, how much do you think you're going to pay me for all the food you're eating and the clothes you're wearing in my house? But the second thing he would remind us is, sons, you've got it easier than I ever had it. He would say, now, when I was growing up, we were so poor we had to walk uphill to get to the school. Apparently, they were so poor they had to walk uphill to get home from the school as well. They couldn't afford downhill or the buses. But, you know, my dad would always say something very important, my brother and me. He'd say, sons, I'm not going to be leaving you a big inheritance or a famous last name. But I am going to make sure you get a great education. Because he says, if you get a great education, there's no limit on what you can accomplish in this great country. He would teach us every day to give thanks to be blessed to be born in the greatest country in the history of the world. And that is what every parent and every grandparent here wants for our children and our grandchildren. We want them to do even better, to be able to do even better than we have done. So it starts with educational reform. Now the reality is here in Louisiana there is a lot of good news. My wife and I, we graduated from great public schools right here in Louisiana. We have thousands of teachers doing a great job teaching our students across this great state today. And we have made a lot of progress, and I want to thank again the returning members. You look back at these last four years. For example, we've increased K-12 education funding over 9%. We have passed good laws, like the Teacher's Bill of Rights, to try to put discipline back into the classroom. We've passed good laws, like the Value Added Assessment Act. So we actually evaluate students at the beginning of the school year and at the end of the school year, so we can reward and recognize those, those teachers teaching at least a year's worth of material in a school year. We have done many things to improve education during these past four years. And there's a lot of good work happening every day in schools across this state. But we also need to be honest with ourselves. We have a lot more work to do to fulfill that promise of providing a great education to every child in Louisiana. As we speak today,
As we speak today, 44% of our schools, public schools, are rated D or F. A third of our kids are below grade level. As we speak today, despite the great progress in retention and graduation rates, we rank in the bottom five in educational outcomes on nationally standardized tests. We've got to do better. You and I both know we would never accept the bottom five, bottom five when it comes to sports teams. We had, one would argue, a pretty good year last year for our LSU Tigers and New Orleans Saints. Yet you won't find a group of more disappointed and anxious fans than right here in Louisiana. 13-1 and is not good enough for us. Just getting to the playoffs is not good enough for us. If we demand excellence on the football fields, as we should, we should be demanding excellence in the classrooms as well. And let's be honest, it really starts with having a great teacher in every classroom. Make no mistake about it, the most important thing we can do is support our great teachers. And by the way, our teachers are the most important, the most important adult in our children's lives other than the parents themselves. When you think about the impact, the influence they're going to have on that child's life, not only in school, but what happens after school as well. I think we should give a round of applause for our teachers in Louisiana, the great job they do every day. There have been various studies documenting the importance of having a great teacher in every classroom. Stanford University, an economist over there, Eric Kanyushek, did a study showing that having a good teacher, having a better than average teacher, can increase your child's earning power by thousands of dollars. Cumulatively per class could have a, an impact on society of hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's estimated that the inability of America to keep up with our international competitors on educational test scores is literally costing our economy. There have also been studies out of Harvard and Columbia showing that if you have a great teacher, if your child has a great teacher in the fourth grade, your daughter is more likely to go to college later in life, less likely to become pregnant as a teenager. Studies after studies have shown having a great teacher will improve your students, your child's success, not only in the classroom, but after the classroom as well. And every one of us here today is sitting here because there was a teacher that took an extra interest in us. We all remember that teacher that either was harder on us saw some potential in us, maybe came to school early or stayed late to help us to succeed. But the reality is we should be doing more to make sure that every child in Louisiana has a great teacher. You know, everybody says they agree with that. You put that on a bumper sticker, we all want a great teacher in every classroom. Everybody says they're for that. Yet our policies today too often make it hard. Our policies too often today discourage great teachers from staying in the classroom. That's why we propose some comprehensive changes. I'll focus on just two examples. Number one, you look at our tenure system. Today, 99, almost 99 percent of our teachers are rated effective in our current system at a time where over a third of our kids are below grade level. And that's why we propose to change our tenure system so we truly recognize and reward excellence in teaching. And we say that teachers that are effective, highly effective, five years in a row should earn tenure. And those teachers that are ineffective should go back on probationary status. And after three years, if they don't get better, if they're the least effective teachers year after year and they're not getting better, they should eventually lose their teacher certificate as well. Because, by the way, that's probably not a teacher you'd want in your child's classroom. It's probably not a teacher we should want in any Louisiana child's classroom. But it's not just about tenure. It's also about how we evaluate, recognize, and reward our teachers. One of the teacher unions objected. They said, look, we're okay with teacher evaluations. We just don't think they should be so strictly tied to student achievement. To me, that is the most absurd statement you can make about educational reform. Educational reform is absolutely about student achievement. Our number one priority has got to be student achievement. <laughs> educational reform is not about the adults in the classroom. It is about the children in the classroom. If we will remember that, we will be bold in our policies. The second big change we're proposing is to change the way that we compensate our teachers. Compensation right now is driven simply by seniority. Compensation should rather be tied to how well a teacher is doing. Hard to staff subjects, hard to staff schools. You know, you think about it, what private business would operate where they went to their employees and say, I can't pay you more for showing up early, staying late, doing a better job? What private sector business would operate if they said you basically have lifetime job protection after three years, regardless of how well you do in terms of performance? 
And that is why we've got to reform our educational policies to make sure every child in Louisiana deserves a great teacher in every classroom to the great teachers. Our message is help is finally on the way. You'll finally be recognized, rewarded, compensated for your efforts. For the teachers that want to improve, you'll finally have real-time data and professional support to get even better. For the teachers who are consistently in the bottom 10% year after year and not getting better, it may be time for them to find a different profession. Because that's not good for our children. They don't belong in the classroom, certainly not here in the state of Louisiana. The second area that we need to focus on as well, we've got to have a great teacher in every classroom. We've also got to make sure that we give every child in Louisiana the chance to get a great education. You know, you put that on a bumper sticker, everybody says they agree with that. No child should be trapped in a failing school. There are some families that can afford to move to a neighborhood with great public schools. Some families that can afford to save up their dollars, send their children to private schools if that meets their child's needs. But there are a lot of families today in Louisiana who simply don't have that choice available to them. And that's why we're proposing to, to truly make the dollars follow the child instead of forcing the children to follow the dollars. When you think about it, that's what we do today. We fund programs. We don't fund children. Every child is different. I traveled the state, went to a Montessori school in Rapids, went to a high-tech uh, program up in Ruston High, went to a TAP school in, in North DeSoto, went to a variety of programs across the state, and they were all different. Because every school is different, every classroom is different, every child is different. And that is why it just makes sense for the dollars to follow the child if they would benefit from dual enrollment courses, online courses, if they would benefit from AP courses, if they would benefit from going to a traditional public school, a charter school, or even a private school. The dollars should follow the child to meet their educational needs. And that's why we're proposing to expand the scholarship program to include students below 250% of poverty at C, D, and F schools across the state. That's why we're proposing to expand our tax code credits to help, to help our families, to let our children know that help is on the way. Now, it's simply not enough. The Coalition for the Status Quo will tell you, look, just be patient. Tell them we're making incremental progress. Tell them we just need more time, more money. I'm here to tell you that's absolutely absurd. Our children only grow up once. A union official in a widely quoted remark said that parents simply don't, don't have a clue when it comes to making choices for their children. I find that offensive and I find that reflective of the top-down, arrogant mentality that has plagued our public educational system for too long. I met with a group of moms at the mansion the very next day and they told me two things. They said, Governor, we make choices for our children every day. And they also said this. They said, we know the educational needs of our children better than bureaucrats sitting in Baton Rouge or Washington, D.C. I can't say it any better than those moms said it to me. They know their children's needs better than the bureaucrats. Some might wonder why are we so focused on educational form. The reality is this. There are really two competing philosophies going, fighting right now here in America. There is a group, the Occupy group, that would try to tell you that it's all about just redividing a, a shrinking pie. I disagree with that thought. I don't think America has ever been about class warfare or envy. I don't think in America you're entitled to your neighbor's house or his car or his property. That's not what America is about. America has always been a country where if you're willing to work hard, if you want to get a great education, you can achieve your dreams. It's about growing that economy. It's about growing that pie so all of our people are doing better. But the key to that American dream, and what makes us so different from those European socialist-style democracies and other countries that simply want to manage their decline, what keeps us a young country at heart, that allows us to continue to grow our opportunities and economy and provide more choices for our children, has to start with a great education for every child. The second big uh, issue and the second priority I want to highlight for you today. We're also tackling the issue of pension reform. Now the reality is our current, our current status quo is not sustainable. We've got an $18.5 billion UAL. That is going to grow by $3 billion by the end of the decade if we don't do anything. We spend $2 billion a year of taxpayers' money on retirement systems as we speak today. And the reality is this. If we do nothing to reform our retirement systems, there are really only three options ahead of us. One, we'll be forced to break our promises to employees. Secondly, we'll be forced to make drastic cuts in health care and education. Or third, we'll have to dramatically raise taxes on the people of Louisiana. And I'm here to tell you, as your governor, I'm not going to allow any one of those three options to happen. 
And that's why we have proposed responsible pension reform that does three things. For our new employees, it allows them to enter a cash hybrid system more like, more like the 401k style retirement programs already available to 80% of the employees in the private sector today across this great country. It would give them portability. It would guarantee them protection against investment losses. Secondly, we want to reform the retirement system for existing employees. Back in the 1980s, taxpayers paid 60% of the load. Workers paid 40%. Today, taxpayers are paying 75%. Workers are only paying 25%. That's simply not fair, and that's not sustainable. We don't propose going back to 60-40. We're just saying let's go back to 66-33. Let's just go back to two-thirds of thirds with the taxpayers still paying two-thirds. For example, let's not base the benefits based on the three highest years of service. Let's make it the five highest years. Social Security, by the way, looks at the entire lifetimes of earnings, an entire career of earnings. We're saying set the age closer. Let's base the retirement age, the normal retirement age, on what Social Security already does. The third big set of changes we're proposing to consolidate two of the duplicate pension boards to eliminate the overhead expenses and make those boards even more efficient today. Save millions of dollars without touching the benefits just by combining the administration. You know, you might wonder why in the world, why in the world are we tackling these big challenges? One of the new legislators came to me and he said, Governor, after he was elected, after he was sworn in, he said, Governor, I was elected to do things, not to be somebody. He said, I already was somebody. I was already a husband, a father, already had a, a good living in the private sector. He said, I didn't need this job. I don't need a title. I got elected to do something for my community and my state. I believe that's why every one of us ran for office because we want to serve this great state. We want to serve our people. The challenges I put in front of you today are not about the next polls. They're not even about the next elections. They're really about the next generation. We have a chance to shape the kind of future we leave behind for our children and grandchildren. I believe like every generation before us, we have an obligation to leave this state, to leave our country better than how we found it. Our parents did that for us. Our grandparents did that for us. It is our solemn obligation to do that for our children and grandchildren. We will debate. I know there are over 1,500 bills have already been pre-filed. We'll be debating hundreds and hundreds of bills together. I chose to highlight for you two priorities. My most important priority this session, this administration's most important priority is education reform. Our second priority is pension reform. And the reason, and we could have talked about dozens of bills today, like economic development initiatives, initiatives to crack down on sex predators, on criminal gangs, initiatives to invest in our infrastructure, all important initiatives. But I wanted to highlight two initiatives that I believe will be transformative for our state. We've had a good four years despite the worst national recession. We have managed to add jobs. We're the only state other than Texas in the South that now has more jobs than we had at the beginning of the national recession. I believe our future is bright. We've got a great history as a state, but I think our future is even brighter. But I also think this is our time. This is our moment to tackle these challenges. Too many times we look back and wonder why our predecessors didn't make different decisions. During the last oil boom, why didn't they diversify the economy? Why didn't they do what the other states have done? In our lifetimes, Miami has grown to be bigger than New Orleans. In our lifetimes, Austin has grown to be bigger than Baton Rouge. It used to be Louisiana, not Florida, that was a gateway to Central and Latin America. It used to be Louisiana, not Texas, that was the energy capital of the South and of the country. Thirty years from now, our children will look back on this day and say one of two things. They'll either say, I am grateful my parents, my grandparents, had the courage to do what was necessary to create a better Louisiana. Or they, like us, will look back and wonder, why didn't they just do what successful states and countries are doing? Why didn't they care enough? to improve our educational system, to rescue this state from the fiscal challenges that await us. The status quo is not an option. There will be folks who will show up at this building and tell you we don't have to do anything. That is not an option. As I close, I want to refer to some words I found. I was reading last week, and I, I found a, a quote from a former president. This comes from President Eisenhower's farewell address, January 17, 1961. And before I close, I do want to note this. I know the debate will be spirited. I know the debate will be open, and I think that is a good thing. But I'd also remind us all, education reform is not a democratic issue. It's not a Republican issue. We need to leave our ideologies, our partisan affiliations at the door. Education and pension reform are Louisiana issues. And so I ask you to join together for the best of our state. And it's in that it's in that vein that I quote from President Eisenhower as I close my remarks. 
He said this on January 17, 1961. He said, as we peer into society's future, we, you and I and our government, must avoid the impulse to live only for today, plundering for our own ease and convenience the precious resources of tomorrow. We cannot mortgage the material assets of our grandchildren without risking the loss also of their political and spiritual heritage. He was challenging and rallying a country on his way out of office. I think the president, I think the general had it exactly right back in 1961. So I remind you as I depart, these issues, it's not about the next poll, it's not about the next election, it's about the next generation. May God continue to bless the great state of Louisiana. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak today. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Clinton now moves that the Senate retire to its chamber. Out of objection, so order.